Gee, August Falcia. Welcome everyone to the Failure on Fubbles event this evening to mark Human Rights Day. This year marks the 70th anniversary of International Human Rights Day, the first being in 1950 to mark the anniversary of the signing of the United Universal Declaration on Human Rights on the 10th of December 1948. The Universal Declaration was proclaimed as a common standard of achievement for all peoples and all nations towards which we should strive. Born of the horrors of the Second World War, it encompasses economic, social and cultural rights, as well as political and civil rights. And it has inspired many human rights instruments, not the least of which was the European Convention on Human Rights. Europe, which saw the beginning of two world wars and has seen really states defile basic standards of humanity in every century, now boasts of itself The Hague with its International Criminal Court, Strasbourg with its European Court of Human Rights, and Geneva, where the human rights hear global evidence on human rights abuses and seek remedy. Ireland itself has sought assistance for violations witnessed on our own soil in the, all of those international covenants and courts, from men tortured with the five techniques in the early 1970s, to families affected by British state violence and collusion, to women suffering egregious harms in institutions and mother and baby homes. The dispossessed are heard in those places more keenly often than they are at home. Two advocates that have been to the forefront of testing those instruments and in courts, battling injustice and demanding the application of human rights law on our shores are Peter Madden and Michael Mansfield. Peter Madden is well-known human rights lawyer, founding his partnership business with Patrick Finucane. His practice has been at the cutting edge of some of the most important and landmark human rights litigation seen on this island. From challenging screening in the 1980s to challenging the state's failure in its positive obligations to the Article 2 of the, human right, of the European Convention on Human Rights to the Bloody Sunday Inquiry. Peter's groundbreaking work has paved the way for extraordinary human rights advocacy. Michael Mansfield is an English barrister, but very much at home in Ireland. He was recently described as the king of human rights work by the Legal 500. Michael has participated in prominent court cases and inquests involving the Birmingham Six, Bloody Sunday, the Hillsborough disaster, and the deaths of Jean-Charles de Menezes and Dodi, Dodi Al-Fayed, and the McLeibel case. A friend of Ireland, we know him so well recently as one of the barristers working for the families affected by the Bala Murphy massacre, and also his involvement in the McGurk's bombing case. You're both very, very welcome this evening. And I'm going to begin with both of you to ask, to go right back to the beginning and to ask a simple question that might be, might be so easy to answer. And I'll start with um, Peter and ask, um, why law? Why did, what attracted you to law? But in particular, what attracted you to human rights law? Well, I suppose it was, um, you know, watching what was going on in the 70s, if I'm born from 69 right through the early and mid 70s in, in, in the jurisdiction and there was no uh, challenge to anything that was going on, any of the uh, abuses and brutalities, mainly by the RUC and the British military, there were no challenges, no legal challenges. And, uh, you know, myself and Pat, Pat Van Dugan, we met you know, many times before we set up on our own to discuss that and to discuss, you know, possible ways of, of, of challenging the, these, these abuses. And we started up in 1979 uh, and, you know, these, these uh, things that I mentioned were still going on. And uh, we started out slowly. I mean, it was just the two of us at that time. And uh, we just gradually grew in the sense that there was an awful lot of cases coming through, an awful lot of complaints coming through. Pat sort of pioneered a lot of the stuff in the courts and pioneered uh, the uh, European Convention cases in Strasbourg uh, in the early 80s, mid 80s. And uh, we sort of just went from there and we got some results most of the time in domestic courts, we didn't get results, but we, we got the, uh, the opportunity to put a case forward. 
So that sort of started it off, and uh, you know, and um, you know, and Pat was murdered, obviously, you know, in 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 in, in relation to cases. Then it was very, it was difficult, you know, it was difficult to 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 I suppose to under, to realize what what had happened, you know, and and try and try and recover in, in some way to that, you know, and that, and that was you know in nineteen eighty nine. Uh, we were in, we were in, in partnership for uh, ten years, and uh, you know it was just having to adapt to that. Uh, I suppose to get over it, to recover it, and then adapt. Uh, and then we sort of built up uh, from from then on with cases going on in the early nineties, uh, right on through. I mean, we took a case in nineteen eighty one to the UN. Uh, special rapporteur on against torture, and uh, we highlighted uh, a number of cases of brutality in Castle Ray, and presented them to the panel. Um, there wasn't really an awful lot of publicity for things they got in those days because publicity was smothered in a lot of cases. But that was an interesting uh, case in which the the panel considered the cases and. Uh, I mean, there's no, there was no um, report, but we got the opportunity to present the case. We continued with uh, cases to the European Court in Strasbourg, and many domestic cases uh, 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 alleging abuses, mainly in the prisons, police stations, and taking taking legal proceedings uh, in those cases. Um, so it was it was almost like a reaction to what was going on outside, out in the street, as to what mm -hmm. people was happening to people in their homes or in the street, and, and uh, you know, and from from when we first started, myself and Pat, it was a reaction to that, and it just slowly built. Uh, so that's that's the, that's the start the start of things. That's how we started yourself Michael so you're not growing up in a conflict society but in England no. you're attracted to law but what attracts you to human rights law as such? Well um, it's very interesting listening to Peter because my experience is the same but not because there's a conflict in the street outside and so what I wanted to say was the answer to your question why was I drawn to human rights law well I wasn't it didn't work like that. I mean, I'm relatively old <laughs> as, it, as it goes. I've been around a long time. I started in 1967, so you can gauge how long. And the origins really for me, I'm not a, I, I wasn't a lawyer. I wasn't born into a legal family or a framework. I was born into a railway family. And I was, I was gonna be the apocryphal engine driver, literally my dad was a controller on the London Northeastern Railway. And he wanted me to have a career on the railways, British railways, as it was then called. And so for me, it's been a different journey, but it is the experience outside of a different kind. I mean, this is very inauspicious. It's not, it's not about a didactic or a polemic, it's about stories that I remember that happened and uh, impressed me to such an extent they stayed with me and caused me to do what I'm actually still doing and the first one I mean I, I don't want to sound too much like John Cleese in a shoebox you know when I was a boy a bit of them but um, I was born during the second world war not the first during the second world war and my father was working on the railways then but because he had um, <clears throat> special duties to perform of an emergency kind. He was given emergency provisions for the family. It was just me at home. My brothers are, were serving abroad. Uh, and it, I was reminded of it the other day because pe people sometimes remember this. Bananas were very important, like gold dust. And my family were allowed, for the three of us, my mum, my father, and myself, we were allowed a few bananas every week, three or four. You know, you, you think, especially at the moment, what's going on, three or four bananas, okay. The thing was, I never got one. <laughs> and so I said to my, you know, I said, 
I thought, what is it? You know, why don't I get one? Is there something about these bananas? My mother would would take me to the area, it's part of North London suburb. And she said, you know, we, we're well off. Um, I mean, we weren't particularly, but you know, she said, compared to other people, we've got some food here. So we're going to give these bananas to other people. And she'd take me, she wouldn't let me go into the houses where she took the bananas. And I thought there must be something about this food that, it, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't that old. It was, it, it started during the war, but it continued after the war. So as I was getting older, you know, I realized this, this whole thing went on because uh, rationing existed after the war. And I'm dense, but <laughs> it's only me who remembers all these things. However, what it turned out was it that, that was this Im, imbuing me with a kind of social justice. That's what it was about. It was distribution of something to other people and being generous and caring. And in the end, you know, I understood why, why they did it, but it left quite a mark on me because, um, you know, and I still loved bananas. So it had a, a, an elongation, but there was another story conjoined with this. It's my mother again. Uh, when she, she, she learned to drive um, a bit late on and she had an old Ford Anglia and my father was disabled through the First World War. And she, she I, I tell this story because it, there it is in my, it, it really emblazoned on myself. I wasn't in the car, but she had a routine. Every Thursday, you know, goes to Sainsbury's, parks outside, nips in and gets what she wants. Old Sainsbury's, not the new hypermarket type. On this particular occasion, uh, she was stopped by a police officer who accused her of parking between the studs of an elect uh, of a pedestrian car, which was illegal. My mother was furious. She said, how dare that? She was summoned to court. And, you know, there she was going to put up a fight. And she did. She defended herself. It got in the local press. She won. Why did she win? because she was able to call my father as a Perry Mason style figure witness came in and said, she would never do this. She is, you know, so a very righteous woman, upstanding believer in, as it happened, Margaret Thatcher a bit later and, and all the rest, as well as God. I don't know whether they're related, but that, you know, and my mother used to say to me, listen, if they'll do that to me, if they'll lie over where I park the car, what on earth are they doing to everybody else? And I thought, yeah, you're right, you're right. And so in a way, she said she called all police policemen blue bottles after that. And she said, you know, never trust a man or a woman in uniform. And so this feeling sort of the social justice distribution and the feeling of challenging authority was stuck there. And so when I saw a series of films called The Defenders that came out of America in the early days, I thought, yeah, that's it. That doing that job of defending and articulating in cases that had an issue of social justice, I thought that brings it together. And of course, my father said, you're mad. We have no means, no resources. You don't know anybody, you know, forget it. But he died. So fortunately, you know, in one sense, he doesn't know I didn't. I didn't take him at his word, but it was, that's where it's come from. And so the human rights aspect came in afterwards. So the cases I was doing, actually, I found myself, a bit like Topsy, it grew. I found myself in the human rights arena, um, surreptitiously, almost through the back door, without realizing that the work I was doing actually came within the convention. So, you know, that's the sort of potted history, if you like. Um so I'm interested to know whether with long and distinguished careers, is human rights work today easier or harder than it was when you began your work? We'll start with Michael this time. Uh, I think it, it's um, strangely much harder. Uh, and really uh, one of the points I, I wanted to make today in commemoration as it will be broadcast, on Human Rights Day is the parlous state in which, you know, we're all living as well as working, particularly as lawyers. The parlous state is that I think we are regressing rapidly. Uh, and that is dominated by a political atmosphere of hostility, the, word, the very word used towards 
uh, potential refugees, we have an environment of hostility to human rights, being blamed for all kinds of shortcomings, as well as the lawyers who practice human rights. And of course, Peter's got, I'm sure, lots to say about Pat Fanukan. And I, I'm reminded of it because, of course, politicians had a role to play then. A certain junior minister and his observations about certain lawyers in the north of Ireland, just as we have a Home Secretary now criticising activist lawyers. So, yes. and without wishing to withdraw the comments made despite um, a petition uh, very largely supported by a huge number of people, lawyers and judges and so on, that he, she should withdraw these remarks. She hasn't. Neither has Boris. In other words, they're proud of the fact they can slag them off because they think that the, you know, the tabloids and others will support them in their view of what lawyers are. Well, I find, you know, that, that's only a small part of it. But then you, 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 you turn away and you look at what actually is going on. And I think that the, the reason it's worse now is we are living in what <laughs> Hailsham of all people said is an elective dictatorship. That's what we've got. There is no accountability, no proper accountability. And you've got a prime minister who absolutely does not care because he believes he can just do what he wants. And it, you know, we had all that over artic uh, you know, the Article 50 triggering. We had it all over prorogation. We've now got it on, it's today, the Internal Market Bill. And I, and I see this as a human rights issue because it was part of Good Friday, the agreement that he signed up to. What was he thinking of? Was he thinking of signing up to it because he wasn't really going to carry it through? It's a bargaining counter, you know, the actual agreement vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the border in the north, uh, which is what he's been doing today. And now he's saying, oh, well, I won't enact those clauses in the internal market bill, despite the fact his own party stood up and said, it's in violation. Yeah. It's so bad now that ministers are prepared, that, which they would not have done, even under Margaret Thatcher, they would not have done go, gone this far, which is, we can get away with saying it's illegal. That'll be all right, you know, we'll pay for it over. Or oh, actually, we're not gonna really use these powers. So I think we're, that's why I think that we're in a parlous state now and trying to fight government in the courts. I just make this as a sort of postscript to this is you need to look at what's happening today, it was a week ago, Lord Fawkes, review of judicial review, the one power left for the citizen to challenge unlawful acts of the executive. One of the few ways it's been possible to do that. Oh, they don't like that. They don't like independent. Look what happened to Lady Hale when she came out with her independent judgment. Oh, well, we've got to do something about the Supreme Court. Next, we'll have, you know, Boris doing a Trump and he'll appoint all his own judges. So that's what they're up to. They, they're not interested in the independence of the judiciary or their judgments or lawyers taking on judicial review. If they can cut it right down and believe you me, when Lord Falk says he won't publish the evidence of the so-called commission that he's been conducting uh, is outrageous. That's how bad it is. Sorry, I don't. But I, it means that I, I'm not put off by this. I'm not depressed by this because, you know, the bigger the red flag, I'm afraid the bigger I stand. Or, and I know Peter would do the same. So, I mean, that, that's my <laughs> sort of thumbnail sketch at the moment. No, I, and I think that, that that's really interesting. Peter, you know, you've seen the darkest of times in terms of uh, before the criminal justice review or before the policing reform. Then you see the Human Rights Act and the introduction of judicial review. And now we're in a different place again. I mean, but what are your own thoughts about doing human rights work currently compared to previous times? Well, I agree with I agree with Mike there that it's that it's certainly worse now in the sense that uh, um, governments, and particularly the British government, uh, seem to think that they can do what they like and there's no accountability. And the example of that, I suppose, from our point of view, is the Brandon Lewis decision there last week, in which he uh, he just completely 
um, he, he certainly blindsided me because I was expecting nothing other than, a, than, a, than an announcement of a public inquiry because I thought that there was no other road to go down. Um, but it didn't happen. And I think that uh, Judge Peter Corey, 16 years ago, published a report saying that there should be a public inquiry into Pat Finucane's case in relation to one particular aspect of it. One, one particular point, he said this in its, in, on its own merits a public inquiry. And now here we are 16 years later and we have, we have Brandon Lewis telling us that uh, there's more investigations to do uh, before he makes the decision. And uh, interestingly, he provided us with a, with a report with actually a review of the De Silva report. And I think everybody would know the De Silva report, what, what, what that, in, in, what that in, uh, involved. But he, he has produced a 70 page, this is Brandon Lewis now, has produced a 70 page report to us and the family there last week. And he, uh, it's a summary of the considerations. But there's 70, 70 uh, pages. Uh, and believe it or not, the document is dated 2015. That's five years ago. Wow. And we haven't seen it. We have never seen it until he produced it uh, to, to the family and said, well, I'm going to get, let you see this report. It's, 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 it's five years old and there are various recommendations in it. I think there are 26 recommendations altogether to the, for the chief constable, some of them for, for the um, police department. But we're not told uh, how many of those recommendations have been carried out. And that's five years ago. So it's like it's the, the, the British government in relation to Pat's case is, is a strategy of delay. At every single yeah. every single time there's a development or we think we've got a, a foot forward, there's a delay. There's some excuse or some reason why there shouldn't be a public inquiry. And that goes right back to the appointment of uh, John Stevens to come in to uh, as a to. to establish a police investigation which we thought well look we don't want a police investigation here we want a we want a public inquiry because the family have no input into a police uh, investigation you're not able to uh, see any of the witnesses or call any of the witnesses you can't cross-examine any of the witnesses and you don't even see all the witnesses ultimately and if there's a prosecution mm -hmm. you're not involved in the prosecution you're not involved in the trial it's a family you, the, 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 if there is a trial, that is, there might not even be a prosecution. So, I mean, that's, that, that, that's what we were, um, you know, we, were, we weren't expecting. Certainly, I wasn't expecting. A lot of people have told me that they did expect the, that decision. And I, I must say, I didn't expect it. And uh, I think that uh, I think it's an outrageous decision. And I think we, we're looking at it now. We're looking to see what, what, what we do about it. And that's in the face of a judicial review that you won that said, basically, uh, nothing that happened before was compliant with the Human Rights Act, Article 2, and all the rest of it. So you've got a decision. And, and this is a good example of uh, government. I mean, it's not just Boris. They're all at it. You know, there's a whole stack of them. And because we haven't got an effective opposition at the moment, he, can, he, he reckons he can get away with it. So, oh, never mind what the courts say. In other words, if we can demean the judges, they're interfering in the political arena. That's what they keep saying. So I think I think the, the Pat's case is a, a remarkable and unfortunate example of how far down the line we've gone in the wrong direction. And and in terms of implications for for all families after Pat's case, you know, because what we see is that probably one of the most high profile killings when it happens. We see um, invested, limited investigations, as limited as they can get away with repeatedly. And then it, it reaches to a point that looked like a high watermark in terms of an apology from David Cameron, where the next steps did seem to be, while it was the De Silva review, it quite clearly opened the doors where you were going Collusion obviously has so much more to it. There's obviously far more uh, interrogation of the facts laid out here that needs to be done. It, it, public inquiry seemed like the way forward. So what does a Secretary of State getting up and throwing things back onto what are meant to be the reformed 
um, criminal justice agencies of the police ombudsman and the PSNI. What does that do to, to the wider processes, Peter? Well, of course, he didn't. Uh, it wasn't just Pat's case that he made recommendations about. He's made recommendations in this uh, in, in this uh, review. This is the one I'm talking about that we got la last week. He made recommendations about other cases. Uh, you know, uh, to say that these have to be um, these recommendations have to be have to be uh, conducted, or at least he's making that he's making that not him, but the the, the uh, legacy investigation branch. We're making suggestions that these other cases would need to be uh, would, would need to be not reviewed because there's also there's also a review process, believe it or not, uh, with in, in, in the PSNI and the Legacy uh, Investigation Branch, a review process where they review these cases in a sequence, and there's a sequence plan where they, they every now and again they review them. So uh, you've got a situation now where. Uh, we are told that Pat's case is due for a review <laughs> in in the new year. So, and all the cases are due review. So it's like it's like almost these cases are sitting on a conveyor belt, and then they review them every now and again. And they're saying Pat's case, despite all the cases, all the judicial reviews we've taken, they now are, are the legacy uh, branch, the legacy investigation branch, are now going to review Pat's case in the new year. So. Everything is very much on the long finger and they want to keep it on the long finger. And that's why I say that the, the strategy is delay and the tactic is delay. At every opportunity that some develop, some develop in Pat's case, and this is in other cases as well, it's not just Pat's case, but they just delay, they, they, they hold back on the documentation and the documentation isn't produced. You have to fight for every scrap of information. You have to point out to the authorities that there are there are, there are other documentation because it's referred to in the documentation that you have, and you know it's just it's it's it's, it's, it's I mean just the question you ask you know is it is it is it better or worse? It's worse in a lot of ways because the state now has adapted itself to challenging or combating lawyers coming in to challenge their 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 version of events, and uh, this is what's happening now. And as Mike says. They are now purporting. They won't now purporting to have reviews into judicial review, which I took part in a, in a discussion about judicial review. Lord Fuchs is conducting a review in judicial review, um, and then the latest there the other day was the um, the the um, Human Rights Act, the, the convention. They they want to do or they want to do a whole uh, review on the convention. In, in other words. Let's get rid of judicial review. Let's 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 cut it down at least. Let's dilute judicial review. Let's dilute the uh, Human Rights Act in some way so that we can do whatever we like. And you know, I agree entirely with, with Mike that it's just it's you know it, 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 it's it's a never-ending battle now when you're when you're trying to get rights for 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 uh, people. You know, not nowadays. You know, it, it, it is. Can I just follow that? Human right. Mm -hmm. I just want to follow that through because there's a sort of logical extension here, I think. Uh, let us assume they were benign suddenly and had a, a moment of truth and a light shone in their mind. It's something impossible to believe of this lot, but however, let's suppose that. And they grant a public inquiry. You think that's the end of the road, do you? Absolutely not. Because the way public con uh, inquiries are conducted now are very different to the ones you might be familiar with in the past. Now, an epitome of a good one for me uh, was the Lawrence Inquiry. Bloody Sunday, you all know about, but you, the Lawrence Inquiry preceded that, where you know a High Court judge did an amazing job in a fairly short space of time. And he called out what had gone wrong. He described what had gone wrong the institutional racism. I don't think anybody at the start ever thought that that would be the conclusion, but it was. And he indicated where the fault lines were, 70 odd recommendations. Now, you won't get that again. That was a full blooded inquiry in which everybody was represented. You were able to ask, and I know Peter, because he was at the same meeting as me the other day, 
you've got to be able to ask questions. It's my mother's point. You've got to be able to ask questions. Not behind closed doors and all the rest of it. In public, so there's public transparency, which happened in the Lawrence Inquiry. They squirmed, they didn't like it, but at the end of the day, it, it achieved quite a great deal, including a concession by the Metropolitan Police Commissioner. Now, what's happening now is something quite different. What we now have is the Inquiries Act. And that was brought about because Mr. Blair found it rather hot under the spotlight when he had to attend a public inquiry and he was uh, orchestrating a change in the law. The change in the law is such that Savile, who did, Lord Savile, the Bloody Sunday inquiry in considerable detail and over a number of years, said that if he were asked to chair a, an Inquiries Act, 2005, inquiry would do it because it gives much less discretion to the chair of these inquiries, basically it's a government inquiry. They fund it, they decide who's going to sit on it, they also have a power over what evidence is produced, disclosure and the rest. And when you get the Inquiries Act these days, it's run by the chair, it's run by council who are appointed to assist the chair and very rarely do anyone else get a chance to ask a question. Now that's not the inquiry of the old. So, as they say about Greeks, be careful what you ask for here, because or, or, I'm not suggesting Peter shouldn't continue asking, but I, I, I'm just giving a warning here that it is, that's why it's so bad. They want uh, control over every aspect of our, well, pseudo-democracy in the, in the sense that, uh, you know, Helsham was right, that's what we've got now. We've got an elective dictatorship. Uh, and uh, I, I'm afraid I go back to that because, you know, that's why the internal market bill was intended. If it had gone, if it goes through in the version that they were intending, it would have clauses which would prevent you challenging it. I mean, it's un, you know unheard of. And he doesn't care if you know there's bullying in the Home Office. Oh, we're not doing anything about that. You know, and if somebody breaks the rules, drives to Durham, we're not doing anything about that. You know, and advisors drop off and they resign. Oh, well, we don't. This is somebody who is uh, cocooned himself in his own self-righteousness and the belief that if he comes up with one-liners, get it done, that the whole nation will fall behind him. Well, I think, hopefully, some people may now have seen through how paper thin the whole thing has been. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, I don't see an alternative rising up to take over the sort of principles that Peter and I have been talking about. I think for um, a great many other families who have been affected by conflict, the idea of Article 2 compliant investigations came about as a result of, um, Peter, your own pioneering work, along with the CAJ, Seamus Tracy, when you were on the board of Relatives for Justice, um, coming up with the strategy to, to take the positive obligations of Article 2, bring them to, to uh, the European Court, and then that judgment that's made there. So much so that, you know, in the lexicon of every family seeking answers to how their loved ones were killed, they talk about Article 2 completely flu fluently now, where before that it, it wasn't even on the radar. And even when you see the Stormont House Agreement, Article 2 is there in the Stormont House Agreement as the standard for, um, for investigations with the Historic Investigations Unit. So to see um, Brandon Lewis this year doing two things, undermining the Stormont House Agreement and the idea of Article 2 compliant investigations for every family, and doing what he's done to the Finucane family with, with uh, really what was a statement of insult, I think, last week. Um, really it creates an environment where people are asking what is the value of the convention and article two after this if a government can can rough, ride roughshod over it like do you still hold hope i mean we're having quite a downbeat conversation do you still have hold, hold hope about what, what families can achieve we'll start with peter and then michael well just um just to follow on from what mike said there about the about the inquiries you know we're pretty you know, we're pretty clear about what sort of an inquiry it will be. But the 2005 uh, Inquiries Act, 
you know, introduced the uh, Section 19, uh, which, which gave, gave the minister the power to issue restriction notices, which in fact stopped uh, documents and people from giving evidence and documents from being produced. Uh, that, that, that's, a, that's the minister. So if you've got a case against the government, you've got the minister of that government coming, around, coming along and, say, and, 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 and issuing a notice saying that you can't, you can't introduce this stuff into the public. And and you know, that's you know that's what we're ta- we're talking about here. Um, a, pu- a public inquiry isn't everything, you know. That you might mean you might as Mike says, be careful what you wish for. But I think we're up for a for for the fight when it, if if we get in there to to challenge any sort of uh, attempt to prevent material from coming out. And uh, you know, there, I've seen some inquiries now, and I'm just wondering if they were inquiries at all because people are not represented even in, 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 in cases. They're not, people are not able to ask questions, as Mike says, not able to cross-examine witnesses or call for witnesses. I mean, it's, it is farcical, but I think you have to try and be optimistic about it and keep on challenging where the challenge is, is, is due and not give up on it. And uh, certainly as far as, uh, as far as Pat's case is concerned, I think they have now got to the stage where they know that an inquiry is inevitable and I don't know why they're delaying it. It could just be because the longer they delay, the longer they have to do the inquiry. But but, but it's inevitable uh, because the, it's such an unanswerable case, you know, for, for public inquiry in view of all the material that is available. You know, from day one, you know, Geraldine said there recently, she was asked, you know, when did she first start uh, thinking about a public inquiry and she said immediately and and, and that's right mm. because as soon as i heard that pat was shot i started thinking thinking back over the last three weeks with with uh, douglas hogg making a statement and the various threats through castle ray and i thought you know this is definitely we have to get in public inquiry here to inquire about all this because at that time we didn't know what was going on and now we have got so much information out there in public domain, one way or the other, you know, from, from people like, uh, like John Ware and Jane Winter, for example, I think Jane deserves a mention. She started uh, off in Pat's case about two years after Pat was, Pat was murdered. And she, she uh, pulled everything together, pulled the campaign together. And it was a very, very formidable advocate for a public inquiry. And, uh, you know, there was so much uh, material that we found out later that any one of those should have should have merited a public inquiry. So, you know, I mean, it's just I think it's just laughable now that, that Brandon Lewis can come along and say, well, you know, you know, we've got these other things to do now, you know, before we can make a decision when none of those other things that he mentioned are actually actually necessary. Because, you know, you don't need you can do all these other things if you want to, but they're not necessary. And they don't. And, and when you're finished, you know, uh, dealing with them, it's not going to add anything more to whether or not you should have a public inquiry. So that's where we are. Yeah, I think yeah. that's true. And Mike, you've been um, involved with Bala Murphy and McGurk's uh, um, more recently. And those two processes are completely framed by Article 2. Yes, I mean, as I'm involved, and there are certain rules applicable to barristers and non solicitors, I can't make any comment um, about either of the two. Um, but what I would like to say, and I was going to pick out inquests, I think there has been a change for the better uh, with the incorporation of Article 2 into inquests. So, for example, another one which I was involved in, I am allowed to talk about it, is Hillsborough. I mean, that was a remarkable, absolutely remarkable, and one of the most historic sort of, if you like, judicial processes that I've been involved in. I've been involved in a few, but to watch what happened there uh, under the um, auspices of a High Court judge um, uh, 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 who who was very strict in, in one sense, but also very clear, and he facilitated a genuine inquiry in a sense, and we all were represented, all the 
families. We were allowed to ask questions, and he kept us. He kept a you know tight rein on it, including on me and all the rest. So I know I get a bit out of hand. That's fine. That's fine. He, but he did a grand job. He did a grand job, and the jury came back with across the board in favour of the families. Now, the, what I was going to say was that it's not just inquests have improved, and we're now getting quite remarkable opportunities in inquests. There are others I can name, but because I'm involved, I, I can't actually speak about them more than the fact that there are others in the pipeline where there are going to be some intriguing inquiries which do challenge government. Uh, and they've, they, they, there's no possibility, the changes are very recent. Of course, they could repeal them all, but I don't think that's going to happen. So there's an area where there's a great deal of positivity. But the other background factor is, I, I, it's a bit of a downbeat message, but actually behind all of it, uh, and you know, in a sense, this follows on from what Peter is saying, I've found from the early days, uh, I don't know, late seventies onwards, what has happened has been, which didn't happen in the previous period, but it's coming to fruition now in a sense, that families, victims, have a collectivity and a solidarity, which when I first started, this sort of campaigning, this sort of uh, collectivity didn't exist. And individual defendants and families just put up with whatever they got and so on. So in a sense, that was difficult for them. But gradually, the black community, the Irish community, they came together because they saw as the Lawrences came over to help Bloody Sunday, Bloody Sunday came across to help Hillsborough, they realized that in each case, there was a pattern of oppression. There was a pattern of dismissal, a pattern of rejection in which most people would probably say, oh, well, they retreat, give up maybe, uh, and, and think, well, you know, life too short, can't be bothered. Can't. But no, no, at the heart of all of these cases was a caucus of families who would never give up because they knew they, the one way you win is to persist and persevere and outlive. And you can do that easily these days because politicians are coming and going, uh, you know, quicker than sandwiches. I mean, that's fine. So they don't have the continuity. Now the, the power has returned to the people. The, the, the fact that the, the, the vehicles they can use and the tools that they can pick up are, are, are not readily available you have to fight, it becomes a political battle. And the only way things are gonna get changed is when, you know, politics, I put it generally, wake up to the fact that communities have a strength that they probably never felt they had before. And I'm, I, I feel, well, not empowered, but I feel enlivened by the fact that people aren't put off by this uh, and that therefore they're not gonna take no for an answer. And they're gonna to join together, gonna to ask the question, they're gonna go on until they, achieve and they shame authority into, and I hope it happens in Pat's case, they are eventually shamed into having to hold a proper inquiry, not a, you know, a newfangled one. So I, I have hope because of the way people have risen together and stuck together. That, so I, I, I think at the moment, it, it, you know, obviously in the middle of a pandemic, one could be, I suppose, uh, uh, very downbeat, but the fact is, even in the middle of the pandemic, I don't agree with them, but there are all these people out there demonstrating, saying it's, oh, it's a hoax, <laughs> we, haven't got a, we haven't got a pandemic, and I have a right to say that. Oh, uh, yes, okay, I don't agree with it, but, you know, that's the extent to which that, that wouldn't have happened before. People have now found a voice and a strength, even though they're themselves in straightened circumstances. You know, they may not have a job, they may not have a room, they may not have, you know, a bright future, but they're not going to put up with it. And you, you can see it every day. There's this resilience, which I think is, you know, for us lawyers anyway, it gives me strength. I'm not sure I could do what they're doing, but I can be fed by them. I can, I can see. Yeah, I think that's this, so, sorry, Andre. I just want to make one short point that this is, this is now going into the second generation now that in, in, in people who are fighting and they find it and they get tired, they don't stop fighting. But the second generation, the new generation coming through takes up the cudgel there. And you can see that in many cases, many families where the young generation, the younger, the children, even the grandchildren now 
are, are continuing the fight because they get the documentation, they read the documentation and they pursue it. And, yeah. you know, in that case, you know, have, you, you know, you have Michael and Catherine and John taking that up from, and helping Geraldine push that through and picking up all the issues and put, pushing it. So it's a second generation. So it, it, it'll never go away really until you get justice, you know, and, 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 and uh, it, it, you know, it, it, everybody knows in, in, in most cases um, what justice is and people know that you have to fight for it. You know, it's not going to be handed to you because the state, the state and states have too much to hide in relation to a lot of cases. And you really have to just keep pursuing it. Yeah. And, and that's a just a short point there, but, you know, into, this, into the next generation. It's very important. I think it is. And we can certainly see that in Relatives for Justice that you just that you see. And sadly, you know, the say parents or even spouses may be kind of elderly or some passing away and they they're feeling that they have pa they they didn't want to pass something on to the next generation. They wanted it done in their lifetime, but they also feel so glad that the rest of the family, they know that it's safe in their hands. I think there's a really important point that's been made by both of you about the delegitimizing of the language of human rights and um, human rights advocacy as though that is something that that is improper rather than a state standing up for it, given that it's the signatory of the convention. That something strange has happened in quite recent times that, sta that um, the state seems to be completely emboldened to delegitimize the concept of human rights. And, and even I think on this island, it becomes quite sectarian in, in how it's explored as well, where human rights are seen as something that are for this community and alienating another community rather than the promotion of universality. You know, is, is there a way that we can, call, can draw, drag this conversation back where people see the primacy of human rights, states' obligations, and that there is a universal nature to it? Michael Start. Well, the dragging back, yes, I, I, I think you can because you do it by example. If, if you come up with enough examples and you have enough pressure from what I call the citizens of the United Kingdom, the millions of citizens, and they, they, see, they see through what they're being told and they don't believe what they're being told. And that's why you've got a problem on all fronts. Government is not trusted because nobody believes what they're saying. You know, so I think, and that, that disbelief is actually beginning to flood the market a bit in other areas as well. So I think once people realize that they may not be t telling the truth and, and each person is going to be affected by this deceit that is practiced on the population in order to maintain power. It's the old thing. They'll promise anything at an election or restaurant. I'm hoping that the, the way you drag it back is politically, it's a political question. We're not going to be able to do it through the courts entirely. We're going to be able to bolster it, package it a bit, uh, give support, but actually fundamentally, you know, people have to combine together to actually, you know, get rid of those politicians. Uh, and I'm not particularly naming anybody. Get rid of the politicians who are doing the manipulation who are only in it for, you know, the, the power aspect, the territory. We all know who they are. There are some who are not. And until we get that situation in whatever form of government we have, that has got an, the element of democracy that is missing, which is why the families, through their various endeavors, are reinvigorating democracy, because here they are voting with their minds and their feet, and not so much the ballot box. But now we've got to convert that force into the ballot box and change what we've got. Because, you know, at the, at the moment, I mean, lawyers used to be at the bottom of the pile. I reckon politicians are at the bottom of the pile now in terms of credibility and trustworthiness. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I think that's why I think the way you drag it is by, I'm afraid, change. And I'm not, a, you know, I'm, I'm not somebody, I'm not talking about armed revolution. You can have an intellectual revolution that happens quite quickly. If, if there's enough willpower to do it, you can change it almost overnight if you want. And I think once people realize they can change it, 
and it does make a difference what they do and they don't step away i think we could create a different culture perhaps not in my lifetime but hopefully we're on the path to that we're kind of coming to an end and i'm i'm just hoping that you might be able to um share with There'll be students of law watching this or people hoping to get into law or, or just starting on their careers. And I'm sure it's quite different now for you must see it with young lawyers to what it was when you first kind of got your gowns and walked out the door of a university. But what, what message would you give to, to younger solicitors now? We'll start with Peter and then come to you, Mike. Oh, I think it's uh, I think it's important that, uh, that that people's rights need to be vindicated, and in some cases, in many cases, they have to be vindicated through the courts. But don't get me wrong; there, I wasn't saying that the state should actually control this type of uh, you know truth and reconciliation process. They should facilitate it, you know, and, yeah. and that's a different thing from actually controlling it. And yeah. uh, and they don't they don't facilitate it. In fact, they they obstruct it. And I think any new lawyers coming in, you know, who follow events, and it's a lot easier now for people to follow events with the internet and email communication across the world now, you know, it's a lot easier. People want to know about issues, they'll find out very quickly the, the various issues that are going on in society. And this is a very important time, I think, because you have got the rise of a lot of authoritarian governments in, in Europe now, and that has to be challenged, you know, it has to be challenged. And, and young people now coming in, and not just here in our country or in England, but, but uh, you know, in, in various European countries, they, 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 you can see it, you can, you, can, you can see what's going on. That sort of thing has to be challenged and you, you can challenge it through the courts as a last resort. Yeah, Mike, what are your own thoughts and me a message to the younger folk? Yes, well, I, I, I come into I, I, I like to come into contact with the younger generation as much as I can because I remember what it was like for me again. I mean, I didn't come from a background which was first in the law. But the one thing, it's back to the social justice point. And I, I'm not talking about commercial lawyers. I'm sure they're wonderful. I'm not talking about tax lawyers. I'm not talking about land registry. I'm talking about those who feel they have a commitment to others to provide a service to articulate uh, issues and situations that actually affect the vast population, which is not, you know, have we got enough money stacked away in the Maldives or whatever, but the person who is worried about the things we all worry about, you know, jobs, income, roof, whatever, family relationships. And I've just been talking to a young person today just before we did this about, for example, the exclusion of black children from schools in the United Kingdom, particularly in the metropolitan areas of England. Now I knew it was a problem, but it's serious. And of course, at the moment we're talking about Black Lives Matter. Um, there, there's a much higher percentage of black children are being excluded from school, from education, which they're saying, oh, we've got to carry on in the pandemic, we've got to keep schools open, well, not for black kids, if you happen to be not fitting the mould. So I give examples like that because I say to the younger person, the problem they've got, I understand it entirely. They're saying, how can we earn a living? That's the first question. How are we going to survive? I used to get asked, you know, a few years ago, how much do you earn? You know, what can you earn at this job? And I'd say, well, that's not the relevant question. It's not irrelevant. You need to survive. But you have to be driven by a different force than earning money. But now you've got to be able to provide the younger person with an assurance that if you want to do this job, first, you've got to have this conscience inside here and a heart to go with the conscience because you'll, you'll get nowhere if you haven't got either. You need both to actually get through the initial stages and stay with it and an element of stamina to keep going. However, if you've got those two, how do you, how do you survive in an economic climate where there have been 40 percent reductions in public funding for cases and so on, civil cases, uh, and a reduction on the crime side as well. Uh, and lawyers are leaving the profession. Well, what I find heartening, and this is a positive thing, 
is yes, public funding has reduced. We're fighting, try and keep legal, legal aid back on the tracks. Hugely difficult. They won't even spend the money on court buildings, never mind cases. However, there is another source which is coming to the fore. And I think, you know, before we know where we are, the government will have an, their eye on this. Uh, and I think it's extremely important because it's <laughs> reintroducing the democratic element. It's crowd justice. In other words, there are lots of issues that can get funded by people who care. It doesn't have to be much money, maybe 50p here or a pound there or whatever. But you get a few million like that and then you get these cases off the ground. That's what they're worried about. So as a lawyer, whether you're doing you know, campaigns or whether you're doing issue-based cases, there is a crowd out there who are going to be concerned about the issues you're concerned about. So my message is, you know, it's difficult. It always has been. When I started, there wasn't really any legal aid or hardly any. Uh, and it's actually blossomed while I've been, during the whole of my career now it disappeared again to some extent. But it's more the question of, are you motivated to do the job? And actually, if you think about it, that applies to, you know, any job you care to think of, whether you want to, you want to be a priest or a bus driver or whatever, or an engine driver in my case, you know, you've got to be motivated. And without the motivation, don't even start. If you've got the motivation, then that's the most important thing. Second thing is the money will come once people trust you. They see you mean what you say, which is most unlike most politicians. You mean what you say and you're going to stand by and you're not going to stand away. You're going to stand with shoulder to shoulder. Then you'll find, you know, the reward will be the solidarity and unison of purpose. End of story. Well, I think there's no better way to finish up on this, you know, um, as we celebrate Human Rights Day, as we remember those who've gone before, the human right def rights defenders, like Claire Riley, like Patrick Finucane, like Raymond Murray, people who stood up when, when they were needed and stood by people who were needed it most. I think, you know, we can only but thank you, Peter, and thank you, Mike, for such an inspirational words tonight and um, bringing us on a journey of where human rights have been, where they are today and the challenges ahead and that we're up for the fight. So many, many thanks and Gura Mila Maya give. Pleasure. Yeah. Thanks. Okay.